This is Justin Ford for From the Front Line. Tonight we are dealing with understanding secular humanism. In the studio with me is Dr. Peter Hammond, the founder of Frontline Fellowship, who has been involved in serving persecuted Christians for over 40 years in 38 countries. Last week we started talking about ideas, ideologies and worldviews that shape our world. Dr. Hammond, uh, before we proceed, could you please uh, just give us a bit of a recap and explain the difference between those ideas or terminologies? Yes, well, everyone's got a worldview. It's just the way of how you interpret everything in the world. And uh, our worldview, whether consistent or inconsistent, uh, uh, whether conscious or not, uh, it determines our values. It influences how we think. Therefore, it guides how we live. You know, your belief affects your behavior. Your creed affects your conduct. Uh, So it's so important that we understand our worldview and the worldviews of the people who are influencing us. So when you're watching a film, remember that the scriptwriter and the producer and director, they've got a worldview and they're communicating that worldview. Same with the news anchor and the newspaper editor, the journalist who's communicating to you. Even the people posting on social media, the teacher in the classroom, they have a worldview. And, and if we can ask the questions and recognize, we'll be able to ah. They're coming at me from either a secular humanist point of view or maybe a Marxist point of view or a New Age uh, point of view. Uh, but it really helps when you recognize the worldview behind. It makes sense. And uh, we've got to be discerning. And starting with this, this is something that really helps you to see behind the scenes, understand the foundations. And therefore, it makes sense of the books, the films, uh, the media, uh, the education, uh, the policies that uh, different political parties are putting forward. It all comes from certain worldviews. And that's why I think today to look at secular humanism is so important because that's a very dominant worldview in Hollywood, in the mass media, and in most of our universities too. Dr. Hammond, how does one distinguish the secular humanist worldview from a biblical worldview? Well, that, that's in fact quite a contrast uh, because uh, secular humanism is a religion. It registers a religion. As I said, if you go up to any university campus, you'll probably find the, uh, the humanist society and the atheist society is listed uh, under the religions, you know, sandwiched right there amongst the Anglicans, the Baptists and the Brethren and the Episcopalians and so on. Um, they are there in their 51C3 tax deductible um, religious entity in America, for example, and uh, even their manifesto, the Humanist Manifesto, describes it as the tenets of religious humanism. So, well, even though most people today think humanism is secular and therefore not religious, but it's a secular religion. And we can see that because <coughs> there's these basic principles that every religion covers. So any ideology, any um, worldview, what is its theological pillar? Well, you'd say, well... Obviously, we know what the biblical worldview pillar is. It's, it's theism. We, we believe in God. Well, their theological pillar for secular humanism is atheism, the belief that there's no God. The Bible begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Atheism begins with, there is no beginning and there's no God. So there we go. There's their theology, atheism. The biological pillar, well, biblical worldview is special creation. God created the heavens and earth. But the biological pillar of secular humanism is evolution. Once upon time, there was nothing, and then there was something, and something became everything. And a bunch of molecules ended up becoming mud and became monkeys and then became man. And a whole lot of time and a whole lot of nothing made everything. And uh, uh, it's basically time plus space plus nothing plus chance equals everything. And it sounds like science fiction to us, but remember, that is their biological position. Um, when it comes to ethics, well, the Bible has biblical absolutes, summarized in the Ten Commands. But the ethical pillars of secular humanism is amorality. Remember, if you put an A in front of something, it negates it. So atheism, no, theism, don't believe in God. Amorality, they don't really believe in uh, right and wrong. They hold to relativism or situation ethics. There is no moral absolute. You know, is it right to lie? Well, it depends. Is it right to steal? Well, it depends. Is it right to kill? Well, it depends. And if it's very young and like a baby in the womb, sure. If it's old and sick, yes, um, euthanasia is fine. What about capital punishment murders? Absolutely not. No, you definitely can't do that. Um, so you can kill babies and you can kill sick people. Um, but you can't kill murderers and uh, things like that. So, but they, they've got a fairly consistent ethical pillar, It's, uh, but it's summarized as relativism or amorality. I mean, just think Bill Clinton, amoral. Um, and then um, what's the psychological pillar? Well, in the Bible, we know it, it's there's dualism. There's good 
in the worst of us because we create by God. There's bad, there's even evil in the best of us because we fall in creation. So uh, our psychology in, in Christianity is pretty much dualism because we fall in creation. But the psychological pill of secular humanism is self actualization or existentialism. Everything revolves around self. Their trinity is basically me, myself, and I. And who cares about the future? Who cares about the past? Who cares about other people? The most important thing is my personal experience now. That's existentialism in a nutshell. Well, uh, what about economics? Well, <laughs> that's very easy to summarize. Economic pillar of Christianity stewardship. I mean, everything belongs to God. And uh, it's entrusted to us, and we are stewards. Uh, but And, of course, the Bible's got key principles like do not steal, do not covet. Uh, but the economic pill of secular humanism is socialism, redistribution of wealth through government interference in the economy. And, well, as Margaret Thatcher put it so well, the trouble with socialism is sooner or later you run out of other people's money. And, well, that's true. Uh, the sociology, well, uh, Christianity, our sociology is – the family is the basic building block of society, and and uh, from the home and the church it develops the state uh, ultimately. So our sociology is, is pretty much it's family based and it's decentralisation. But the sociological pillar of secularism is a classless world society, which implies the abolition of the traditional family. And it takes a village to raise a child, and forget about it takes a family to raise a child. Uh, they want they want the village, or what they mean is the UN, to raise your child. And uh, so secular humanism has a vision of a classless, now genderless, um, uh, nationless uh, society where you've got a one-world government, a one-world interfaith uh, situation, a, um, a one-world interfaith religion, and a one-world economic system. It sort of rings a few bells from Revelation 13. The political pillars, well, Christianity holds to a decentralized constitutional or a republic or constitutional monarchy. And so uh, we believe very much in decentralization, whereas the political pillar of secular humanism is globalism, the establishment of one world government, one world economic system, and a one world interfaith religion, all of which the Bible warns about. So you can plainly see, in fact, Psalm 1 speaks about the contrast between uh, God and man. And you can you can see that Jesus also summarized this, the, the blessings of obedience, the curse of disobedience, uh, that the righteous are like a tree that's planted by streams of river producing fruit, uh, whereas the, the wicked are not so. They're like a chaff uh, on the wind and they've blown around and drop of water on a wave. They're up and down and backwards and forwards. So, yes, um, also when Jesus spoke about building a house on the rock of God's word as opposed to the sand of human effort and humanism, if you can summarize this all, you could say humanism is building on the sand and Christianity should be building on the rock of God's word. And you may survive for a while on humanism, but sometime the winds will blow, the storm will rage, the rain will fall, the floods will rise, and a house built on the rock will stand. But the house built on the sand, such as humanism, it'll collapse. Dr. Hammond, what kind of a house has been built? How does, how does secular humanism manifest itself in polity today? Okay, so... Secular humanism has an agenda. So to summarize it, the idea that man is a product of evolutionary chance must be taught as a scientific fact in schools and the media, you know, billions of years ago and all that sort of thing. So evolution is one of their pillars. Uh, education must be controlled by the state. Now, interestingly enough, that's something that was first propagated by uh, Karl Marx, Marxist Manifesto, 1848. The state should certify teachers, train teachers, uh, run the schools, compulsory education, choose the textbooks and all that. And so state-controlled education is a Marxist idea. And all secular humanists seem to basically accept that education must be controlled by the state. So they're not too thrilled with private education, independent education, Christian education, church-based education, let alone home education. I mean, they're, they're very much against those things in general. Uh, so... The humanist believes education must be controlled by the state. And you'll see them trying to worm in to even saying what curriculum the homeschool teachers must use and uh, what Christian independent schools must use, which means they're no longer Christian or independent if the state's choosing the curriculum. Now, of course, the secular humanist wants education that's secular, free of moral absolutes and expressly non-Christian. So they're hostile to religious, biblical, Christian education. They want secular 
amoral, evolutionary, situation ethics type of education. And more and more, it's critical race theory and gender confusion and all of that sort of thing too. They, along with this, they generally are pushing compulsory sex education in state schools. In fact, they're going even further than that and wanting it uh, forced on the private independent Christian schools too. And there's a lot of battles to try and infringe on uh, the independent Christian schools and force these kind of vile agendas on them. Of course, pornography must be legalized and it's called free speech. Not that pornography is speech at all and doesn't qualify, but still. Funny, they've got strong laws against libel and slander. But bless me, pornography, that's not a problem. So um, pretty inconsistent. Abortion should be legalized on the basis that it's a woman's right. Uh, they say they're pro-choice, but of course the baby doesn't have a choice. We say pro-choice, that's a lie. Babies don't choose to die. Uh, homosexuality must be accepted on the basis of an alternative lifestyle. Now they've gone far further than that. It's now LGBTQ plus at infinity and who knows what else. Um, and there's multiple genders and there's all kinds of weird uh, sexual rights that they've suddenly discovered and cooked out of nowhere. Uh, but this, they say, must be accepted and pushed even in primary schools. In fact, they've gone berserk against uh, Governor DeSantos in Florida because they brought out a bill protecting children under grade four from having uh, sexualized education and uh, pushing perversion and uh, all these uh, sexual and gender identities upon uh, kids in primary school. I mean, we're talking about uh, grades one to four only. And next thing, you think that uh, there's, you know, if there's child abuse. Yes, they're trying to protect from child abuse, but the secular human has gone m m mad. They've lost their minds uh, over this, um, over on the Santos, telling them that you're not allowed to groom kids for, you know, with uh, sexual perversion, all that stuff, and, and gender confusion. Now, secular humans tend to be very soft on crime, so they generally believe that criminals should be treated as victims of society requiring treatment and rehabilitation. You see, crime isn't the fault of the criminals. It's the fault of society. Society is collectively responsible, and society should be punished rather than the criminal. So you just think how in South Africa we used to have criminals in prison, and in Mandela's first few months in prison, uh, uh, in presidency, they opened prison doors and let about 100,000 people out of prison. And I don't think these were political prisoners. The political prisoners had been released under uh, de Klerk already uh, long before that. Uh, these were criminals, violent criminals in many cases. Some were raping, murdering, uh, robbing within uh, 24 hours of being released. So the recidivism rate was colossal. Um, but generally, humanists believe that uh, criminals should be free, uh, and that generally puts the rest of us behind bars, whereas we've got to... Um, uh, basically uh, put bars of all of our windows and doors to protect ourselves in our own homes. When the criminals are out in the streets, well, they're not just in the streets in Parliament now. Uh, firearms for self-defense must be limited, ultimately banned. In fact, uh, the government should have a monopoly on weapons and force, um, it would seem, isn't their viewpoint. <clears throat> Secular humanist countries generally confiscate firearms, as you have seen taking place in communist countries and uh, Sadly, many globalist New World Order countries too. And so basically what they want is gradual uh, centralization and authority in a centralized big government. Ultimately, what you offer is a one more government. Um, they're definitely building a house of cards and it seems that the walls are designed to be moved around and given that it's based on situation ethics. Um, is secular humanism essentially evil, even satanic? How do we defeat it? Yes, well, I mean, first of all, you can see the results of secular humanism over contemporary society um, and in page of history because the agenda I've just listed, you can see what's its results. Revolutions, massacres, totalitarianism in the communist East, permissiveness and decadence in the so-called democratic West, the pornography plague, the drug epidemic, the crime explosion, uh, violence in the streets, the uh, critical race theory, um, cancel culture, escalating inflation, abortion, holocaust, the AIDS and STD, sexually transmitted disease pandemic. I mean, all these are the results. So as Jesus said, you'll know a tree from its fruit. So uh, secular humanism actually is diabolical. Uh, you, you can see it from the results, but you can also see it from the roots. So what has happened is secular humanism uh, – is plainly evil, and you can see this with a whole lot of ease. I mean, evolution 
Satanism is basically a retroactive attempt to abort God, an attempt to destroy all meaning, all purpose, all direction, and hope in life. You know, you came from nothing. You're going nowhere. Life is meaningless. Uh, the education system is also quite uh, an insidious attempt to kill God by eradicating him from the classroom and from the minds of the next generation. So uh, the education system is actually an attempt to kill God retroactively, to remove the foundation of truth, the only objective standard by which reality can be evaluated. The ethics rejects the law of God. It promotes situation ethics. It promotes amorality and existentialism, hedonism, pornography, homosexuality, so-called sex education and abortion. In entertainment, you can see the evil by how superficial, sensational, immoral material predominates in the modern so-called entertainment industry. It's producing an increasingly superficial, selfish, mindless, immoral society. In the economics of uh, secular humans, you can see the unworkable wastage of socialism and welfare. It destroys incentive. It destroys initiative. It destroys income. It destroys industry. In the environment, you can see secular humanism in the selfish short-sightedness of modern society, which is clearly seen in litter-strewn communities, pollution-afflicted areas. In the eschatology, well, you can see this eschatology of defeat and retreat, which has produced a pessimistic, defeatist, self-centered, escapist generation, where people are just hoping to uh, escape, that the rapture might uh, bring them out before the consequences of all their laziness and cowardice uh, comes to fruition. And it results in exhaustion, bombardment by brainwashing and overstimulation by images most in our society are mentally exhausted, spiritually exhausted, emotionally exhausted. And this should result in some people being enraged in a righteous sense. The abortion holocaust should awake a holy anger in us. We need to rediscover a righteous indignation against the tides of evolutionism. Uh, we should be against the plague of pornography and other effects of humanism. Um, you're still sticking with E, you could say E should be for enough. Um, we should be enlightened. God has spoken in the Bible to all areas of life. We should be enthused. The Bible is most relevant and it provides the practical solutions to every contemporary problem. We should be energized. Instead of being paralyzed by pessimism, we need to be energized by the biblical eschatology of victory. God is not predestined defeat for his people. And we should respond with endurance. The trials, the traumas and the tribulations of this present time need to be understood as training, as tests to strengthen us for the Lord's service, to purge and purify and prepare us to be more prayerful and powerful. And it should result in some eradication. We are Christians who can fight the good fight of faith in the confidence that evil will ultimately be eradicated. So, yes, humanism is essentially satanic, and the Son of God came for this very reason, to destroy the works of Satan. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. Greater is he who is in us than him is in the world. Submit to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from us. Dr. Hammond, you mentioned the word eschatology twice, once under your E for evil list and once under your E for enough. Could you just explain the term for listeners who aren't familiar with it? Yes, so eschatology is particularly speaking about uh, the end times and our understanding of the end times. Now, of course, the end times includes eternal judgment and eternal destinies of heaven and hell, but it also includes a whole lot of other things. So when you've got, uh, when you think of what the Bible is speaking about in general, you've also got to think of uh, the prophecies that will be fulfilled. And there is a biblical vision of victory in the Bible. As Christians, we're not doomed to defeat on earth. We're destined to victory. God doesn't predestine defeat for his own people. And so the fulfillment of Christ's great commission should be our supreme ambition. We should not be obsessed to be raptured from our responsibilities on earth. Our faith should be strengthened by the victorious vision of the Bible, not neutralized by defeatist view of the end times. And many are defeated, you know, defeat and retreat. Uh, our understand the future should inspire us to positive prayer and action, not paralyze us into inactivity by an es eschatology of escapism. I'm afraid a lot of people have an eschatology of escapism, uh, just praying, Lord, may you come before my exams and, you know, come before the elections or, you know, things, just wanting to escape. Instead of getting out there and fighting and standing up for what's right and doing what's got to be done in terms of spiritual warfare, um, we should long to see the church revived and faithfully making disciples of all nations. We shouldn't be longing to be removed from our responsibilities here on earth. God's put us here for a purpose. And so the glory of Christ should inspire us to greater service for him. We shouldn't be 
tied up with speculations about the Antichrist depressing us into inactivity. And the Bible is clear. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the earth will be as filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the seas are full of water. So plainly, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that should give us a great optimism for the future because we serve an almighty God. He answers prayer. The word of God is powerful. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. We should be working towards a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and when he will reign forever and ever. And to that end, we are commanded to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all things that the Lord has commanded. And that's part of what the biblical worldview summit is all about, teaching obedience to all things the Lord has commanded, applying the Lordship of Christ to all areas of life. Why is it so important to have a biblical worldview, or should I say to consciously, consciously cultivate a biblical worldview? Yes, well, the Lord did warn of the danger of building your life on the sand. And we know it would be stupid to build a house on the sand, well, it's just as stupid to build our lives on the sands of humanism. You came from nothing. You're going nowhere. Life is meaningless. There's no right and wrong. There's no ultimate justice. No... What a terrible foundation for anyone's life. Uh, our, our Lord told us, build upon the solid rock of the unchangeable word of Almighty God. And so when the rain falls and the floods rise and the winds blow and when the storm rages, the house built upon the rock of God's word will stand. But those lives built on the sand will collapse. And so... Most Christians tend to see the world in bits and pieces instead of the whole picture. So too many Christians feel like Christians, but they think like humanists. You know, our heart might belong to the Lord, but the head, hmm, it's often been conformed to this world. And so all too many seem to have Christian hearts, but humanist minds missing heaven by um, 11 inches, basically, the distance distance between your heart and your head. And uh, it's so important that our head is not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds, and a heart. Well, that should be loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And again, that's what one tries to do in a biblical worldview seminar, is that you learn to love God with all of your heart, and devotions with all of your mind, lectures and applications, uh, with all of your strength, that's practically. Uh, so, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we should be loving the Lord. And, and that, let's remember, we are commanded to love God with all of our mind, and that requires renewed minds that have a biblical worldview. Dr. Hammond, why do we talk about a biblical worldview instead of a Christian worldview? I think the importance here is the difference between objective and subjective. There's a lot of opinions about what's Christian. I mean, you've got people who are Catholics and Mormons who call themselves Christians. Uh, what do they mean by that? You've got Arminians calling themselves Christians. You've got people who belong to some uh, pretty uh, questionable beliefs, um, and some of the word of faith movements and name it, claim it and frame it, gab it and grab it, a uh, crowd, a prosperity cult, and they call themselves Christians. So when we speak about a Christian worldview, people may think of all sorts of things as, as Christian. But when you speak about a biblical worldview, well, that's more objective. So, for example, you could say that your conscience is like a compass. Now, a compass can be helpful if you have a correct understanding of where you are on the map. But you could be um, following your compass, but you've got a wrong perspective where you're on a map and be going maybe even on the right road, but in the wrong direction. So it's so important that we have a biblical worldview. Uh, obviously, a biblical worldview should be Christian. But if you start with a subject of, well, I think. So you ask a bunch of Christians these questions like, um, uh, what is the biblical view of economics? Uh, that's a question I ask people or of crime and punishment. And the average Christian obviously has no understanding. But the only answer you get to uh, biblical economics for most Christians is we should tithe. Okay, but that's not all of economics. There's a lot more to it than that. Uh, do they have any understanding of private ownership of property, of free enterprise, uh, of the f uh, prohibition against socialism that do not steal, do not covet, uh, and understand uh, what biblical economics is like? No government should be able to uh, tax as high as 10%. That's oppression. And the Bible makes it very clear that you're not to tax property and you cannot tax inheritance and you cannot tax people full-time involved in the service of the Lord, not even the choir, which was actually full-time at that time in the temple. So um, a biblical economics would involve a whole lot of things that people today don't understand, like honest money, uh, prohibitions against inflation, which is a hidden tax, and so on. So, uh, But when you say biblical worldview, 
suddenly you're no longer talking about a compass, uh, something subjective, but you're talking about something objective, like you're climbing Table Mountain, there's this hulking great big cairn. Maybe it says on it, uh, McClear's Beacon. There's a pile of rocks there. This is hard evidence. Now, you may say, well, I think that we actually in Echo Valley uh, or at the top of Skeleton Gorge. But, but here you've got this objective reality. It doesn't matter what you think or feel. It doesn't even matter what your compass is. You can see the hard evidence in front of you. Here's this pile of rocks cemented and says McClear's Beacon. If I think I'm anywhere else, I'm wrong. You know, my perceptions are not uh, – don't trump reality. There's reality, hard evidence. So that's what we mean by biblical worldview. So biblical worldview is like you've – there's the lighthouse. That's objective. Uh, your feelings are irrelevant at this point. You know, well, I feel a lighthouse should be over there. Well, it doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter what you think. The important thing is what's reality and the Bible's reality. So a person can say, and I've asked people, and I've had people say, well, I asked, what would Jesus do? And I believe in G uh, if Jesus was in my situation, he would have chosen an abortion. I've literally had somebody say that. Or, well, my God would never condemn anyone to hell. Well, my Jesus would never condemn homosexuals. In fact, you have even Archbishop Desmond Tutu who famously claimed that if homosexuals aren't allowed into heaven, he doesn't want to go there and that he couldn't worship a God who's homophobic, quote, unquote. So there you've got someone who's allowed his perceptions and his prejudices to trump biblical doctrine and objective reality. And this is, you know, this will kill you in mountain climbing if you go on your feelings instead of the objective cans, uh, the map, the reality. You can't just go according to your feelings and according to the compass. You've got to uh, have the map, and the Bible is the map, and you've got to observe the hard realities that God's put before us. So, yes, when we call it a biblical worldview summit, we make a more solid, objective stand. There are certain facts in the Bible and the Ten Commandments, uh, which God wrote on tablets of stone with his own finger. And there's some immovable realities such as that there's two genders. God made them male and female. I mean, that's biblical. Today, there's some characters talking about 70 genders and so on. Well, um, they can think what they like, but uh, there's this amusing thing where you saw uh, a T-shirt being sold. There's more than two genders. But when it came to ordering, you could choose male or female. Uh, and this is typical where they ignore the reality and they, they can't see how foolish this makes one look. Uh, when you are trying to ignore the basic reality of the world that God's made, God has spoken to us through the word of God, special revelation, and he's spoken to us in the works of God, creation, general revelation. Dr. Hammond, if um, humanism is based on a moral, an amoral, ethical worldview in which there's um, no fixed truth, that means we're living in a fake world. You know we are. We're living in a, such a fake world that today... It's the truth that offends people. People are more offended by the truth than they're offended by, by the lies. And it's much easier to deceive a person than to convince them that they've been deceived. Uh, just take the fact of the masquerade madness, the whole lockdown lunacy and the salvation by vaccination COVID cult. Uh, to, to lie to people is obviously much easier. This vaccine is safe and effective. And uh, if you take this vaccine, you will not get COVID and you will not be able to transmit. Well, we now know that's a lie, but but not millions, billions of people believed this and got vaccinated. And of course, uh, with all kinds of sad consequences as a result. Uh, but it's been harder to convince people that they were lied to. I mean, my government wouldn't lie to me. Well, unfortunately, they do. Uh, so we've got fake leaders. We have fake money. Uh, we have fake politicians. We have fake elections. We have fake pandemics and we have fake vaccines we have fake medicine uh, and you can just look at so many things just think of the fake heroes in our society uh, there was a time that that films were made on great heroes Cromwell General um, uh, Charles Gordon a uh, cartoon film uh, King Alfred the Great uh, Richard the Lionheart and you know King David uh, real heroes biblical heroes heroes in history today most of the heroes are fake heroes you know, it's Marvel Comics, Superman and Captain America. I mean, they're totally fictional. Why would we lift up to a new generation fake heroes? There's real heroes in the Bible. There's real heroes in history. There's real heroes even in the world today. But instead, they're giving us fake heroes and fake narratives and fake crises 
uh, such as the climate change. In fact, I think it's been well said that many of the climate change uh, greens are like watermelons. They're green on the outside, but they're red on the inside. Um, Marxism has basically taken over the environmental movement to advance a communist agenda, a Soviet agenda where it's government by committee, where the the state can tell you what you can do, where you can go, uh, what you're allowed to do and say and so on in accordance with this fake crisis that they've set up. Bear in mind that it was the last dictator of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, who died recently. Mikhail Gorbachev is the one who, when he uh, resigned from being or was replaced from being head of the Soviet Union, Christmas Day, 25th of December, 1991, what did he do? He went straight over and launched the Green Cross in America, set up his offices in the Presidium in San Francisco. The whole Central Committee of the Communist Party Soviet Union moved over to the West, moved into America, and they started to plan Rio climate uh, uh, crisis, Rio 1992. And who wrote the Earth Charter as the new Ten Commands, the new Sermon Mount? Mikhail Gorbachev. And he... uh, produced the whole new agenda, climate uh, agenda, which was called Agenda 21 for the 21st century and then later Agenda 23. And Mikhail Gorbachev played a key role and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, who had bankrupt the Soviet Union, had to abandon it. They were now parasiting on the West. They moved over and they took over a whole lot of Western universities and Western Green Movement and three of the UN were able to, to advance the communist agenda, which is the state or the party determines who can do what, where they can do it, when they can do it, how they can do it, what you've got to wear, how you've got to behave, what you're allowed to say, and they're doing it all in the name of saving the planet. I mean, how clever is that? So, yes, they, they get not the order of Lenin, they get the order of the watermelon, green on the outside and red on the inside. So we've got a lot of fakes out there. They're giving us fake history. They are giving us fake news. Uh, in fact, there's no doubt that there's a lot of fake news. And um, it's the um, American previous senator... Uh, Robert uh, Kennedy Jr., he said the biggest contribution of funds for advertising on mainstream media are uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, and Johnson Johnson. It's the vaccine-producing Big Pharma. Big Pharma are controlling the news. I mean, they actually fund and own the news because they're the main advertiser. Well, there's a bit of conflict of interest, wouldn't you say? So isn't it interesting we're living in such a fake world that we often don't even know the names of our neighbors, but we feel connected to strangers the other part of the world through social media, which is a bit weird, where we're more concerned about what strangers far away think and feel than our own family or neighbors. Um, bizarre, we've got fake personalities. They're now talking about having your own avatar and virtual life through the metaverse, where while lying on your couch, you can go and meet your date, who's uh, not, you're not meeting a date, your avatar's meeting your your date avatar in some metaverse Starbucks and uh, it's the entire life is an extension of fiction. It's a virtual life, but it's not a real life. And uh, what we're seeing is uh, people are uh, literally bailing out of reality and moving into the fake. You've got fake people. You've got fake uh, profiles. It takes courage to be honest, to refuse to bow to pressure, to refuse to not follow the herd to refuse to pretend to be someone or something different. We need to speak the truth even when it's not popular. There are only two genders. Marriage can only be between a man and a woman. And we say no to the masquerade madness, the lockdown lunacy, the salvation by vaccination, um, COVID cult. We say no to the fake news and the fake entertainment and the fake journalism. I mean, just think how many movies, how many major movies which got vast amounts of um, Academy Awards, which are just bunch of millionaires and handing gold statues between one another, mutual back-scratching uh, operation where I'll give you a gold statue this year, you give me a gold statue next year. Harvey Weinstein, a, a plain, occultic, satanic, pedophile, uh, hideous um, uh, pervert and uh, uh, rapist, uh, he was the producer and director of how many major, major, major films, including Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom, and others that have influenced our society. And this, these are the people producing the Hollywood films and entertainment that, that shape people's minds. So we've got fake heroes. We have fake uh, enemies. We have fake allies. And uh, we have a fake reality being presented to us. There's fake scientific research, fake medicine, huge amounts of fake medicine. 
even fake food, fake money, fake choices, fake economies, which are built on nothing but debt, piled upon more debt, piled upon more bubbles. United States is $8 trillion in debt. Now, just for an idea of what that means, um, when you're talking about a trillion dollars, if you had $100 bills and they stacked on pallets, tightly packed, um, you would get, let's see, you pile up the pallets. You could fill these pallets from one side to the other of a football field and double per stack them, um, not just a ton, but two tons of pallets on top of one another. So basically two football fields of pallets of $100 bills stacked up in a, uh, two tons in a, on a pallet. And uh, that's $1 trillion in terms of notes. And $18 trillion in debt. That's what America is right now. It's beyond comprehension. The African Union Task Force on Corruption estimates that over 32% of Africa's gross domestic product is stolen by corruption by governments. Now, so we have fake governments, we have fake elections, we have fake vaccines, we have fake democracies, fake republics, fake national security, fake education. Their education is not teaching people how to think critically, how to question everything, how to check the context and the source. No, uh, they are indoctrinating pupils, telling them what to think. Repeat after me. We have fake laws, um, fake rights. I mean, since when is there a right to abortion or perversion or blasphemy? Uh, this is bizarre. And uh, there's false flag events. So there's, there's fake crises, fake uh, history. Karl Marx said the first battlefield is the rewriting of history. And have his followers ever been super busy rewriting history? Um, my first history teacher, Mr. Rhys Davies, says, but we're the victor's version. Wartime propaganda morphs into peacetime textbooks. Uh, you know, never trust the textbook. Don't regurgitate textbook. Think outside the box. Ask what's the context. Why? Uh, check alternative resources. Go for first-hand accounts and contemporary areas. Uh, don't accept the official version. And so there's a need for real history because there's been a lot of lies, a huge amount of lies. And you just think of how much has been uh, basically censored uh, by the states and how much fake news has been piled up upon uh, more and more. Uh, why is there, uh, in so many cases, huge amounts of uh, data that's still um, unavailable to the public. Uh, everything from the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, uh, Operation Keel Hall, the, the Catan Forest Massacre. For generations, these things were kept away from people. Uh, even MLK files, Martin Luther King files, are still sealed. Even Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, files of communications around June, July of 1943, still sealed, still not allowed to look at it which is awfully suspicious because the Polish people are convinced to this day that their wartime leader, their head of their government in exile, General Sikorsky, was murdered by the British intelligence, probably alongside the Americans or in conjunction with them, uh, on the 4th of July 1943 in Gibraltar. And uh, interesting that all of Churchill and FDR's communications at that very time are still sealed. Um, how many decades after the war? And the Polish people are convinced that their allies murdered their head of state, along with his daughter and his entire uh, government in, in exile, and uh, uh, all because they were asking too many questions about the Catan Forest Massacre, which everyone knew was done by the Soviets, who were meant to be an ally. And to save the face of Stalin's brutal dictatorship, they blamed their enemies, the Germans, who couldn't defend themselves in this, and they murdered the Polish head of state, um, General Sikorsky, uh, for daring to question it. There's so much fake out there, no end of amount of fakes. We've got fake polls, fake experts, fake think tanks, fake fundraisers, fake videos, fake people, fake audio. We've got fake food. Um, and with all of this, it's so important for us to be true to God, to dare to be a Daniel, to dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose for him, dare to make it known. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that's why you need a biblical worldview summit and a biblical worldview uh, because we're living in a fake world and we need to stand for truth. Dr. Hammond, it sounds like a house of cards built on sand that the humanists, uh, that the globalists are using to impose a, a, a world view and a society from, from the top. Um, and they seem to be playing on the 
bad side of uh, human duality, which is you know good and bad. Um, how so? Can you give us some resources that would help us to uh, bring out the, the better side of our, ourselves and our society? Yes. So, for thirty two years, every January we run a biblical worldview summit. Uh, where we seek to get an in-depth, intensive uh, look at uh, the forces around the world, the ideologies, the ideas that change the world, understand the times and to know what God's people should do. And we seek to apply the Lordship of Christ to all areas of life. So we focus on on not just exposing what's false, fake, and, and fraudulent and dangerous, but on the biblical, Christian, practical, provable, hard work, um, uh, we boots-on-the-ground kind of solutions. There's some great books that one can uh, turn to. Understanding the Times by Dr. David Noble, The Battle for Truth by David Noble. I've written Biblical Principles for Africa and a Biblical Worldview Manual. These are very helpful, useful. We've got uh, Re- uh, Reformation or Renaissance, um, and uh, that's that's also tackling the worldviews on, on a basically. We've also got uh, DVD box sets and audio visual box sets, MP3 box sets on the Biblical Worldview Summit. So a person can contact christianlibertybooks.co.za and order either these box sets or books, uh, DVD series and so on. Uh, you can also go onto the Frontline Mission SA.org website and see some of the presentations, lectures, videos, and uh, listen to some of the audios of lectures given at previous Biblical Worldview Summits. And of course, if you're able to travel to Cape Town in the beginning of January, from the 5th to the 12th of January, we're running a Biblical Worldview Summit near Cape Town, and it's it's a really body, mind, and spirit, uh, head, heart, and hands, um, stretching mind, stretching muscles. It's it's a lot of fun. It's it's a lot of activity. Uh, it's not just great lectures and some fascinating films and other good materials and discussion groups. It's a lot more than that. Uh, it's it's really, an, uh, many people have said, the best conference they've ever attended and changed their life, and, and uh, folks have come from as far afield as Canada and New Zealand, from uh, Russia and from uh, Germany and Ireland and uh, all over Europe, Switzerland and Austria. We've had people coming from all over the world to our camps and courses uh, from far field as as, uh, uh, Sweden, Switzerland, uh, Pakistan, even Kenya, Ghana, Congo, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Zambia. Uh, So if you're interested in the Biblical Worldview Summit, um, it's coming up on the 5th to the 12th of January uh, near Cape Town and you can uh, email mission at frontline.org.za mission at frontline.org.za or you can go onto the website frontlinemissionsa.org and uh, look under events and you'll get the details and also on there there's some videos of previous courses some radio programs and and you could also click on some of the reports of feedback that people have given after previous biblical worldview summits we've done biblical worldview seminars and summits in all kinds of places around the world, but this is the the week long intensive one uh, near Cape Town, which uh, you will get uh, more insight than anywhere else. And if you can't come to the course, well, try and get the textbooks like Understand Times, uh, Battle for Truth, Biblical Principles, South Africa, or the Biblical Worldview Manual. Thank you, Dr. Hammond, for dissecting and diagnosing the ills that uh, um, ail our society and for prescribing some treatments. Um, I would like to close with the quote that sums up the Biblical Worldview Summit's intent. It's from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Thank you very much for joining us for From the Frontline. God bless and good night.